Welcome to Oxford Big Questions. Uh, I'm Matthew, a second year historian from Corpus. <laughs> We've got great expectations. <laughs> and that's um, Matthew's mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're in Oxford because we love to be, ask big questions about our subjects. And we have a brilliant opportunity to ask the biggest questions about life as well. And here at Oxford Big Questions, what we aim to do is give an opportunity to think about, discuss, ask questions about the biggest questions of life from a Christian perspective and also the biggest kind of questions which people ask when coming to uh, think about Christianity, some of the barriers maybe that people feel. Um, we, it's a great pleasure to have today with us Simon Edwards from the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics who's going to be asking uh, this big question, where does our value come from, and answering it. We're going to have a short talk, uh, there should be a Q&A afterwards. Uh, there will at some point come up a QR code on the screen so you can uh, go through that and submit your questions online. But I will ask for questions from the floor as well. Um, but I think that's everything that I need to say. Uh, apart from that, um, we aim to be done by 1.45, but we might be a bit later now. So um, if you've got tubes or lectures or whatever to get to, feel free to leave when you want. But now, uh, welcome Simon. Thank you very much. Ah, lovely. Wow. Thank you for that big questions. Warm welcome. A little bit about me in 15 seconds. I'm from Australia. That's the accent. Married, three kids, uh, lawyer by background, have studied here and have written a book uh, which is uh, for people who assume that Christian faith or belief in God in general is irrational, irrelevant or possibly even immoral. And in that book, I try to uh, 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 pose another way of thinking about it. Uh, and to raise questions and begin a conversation. But today, I am delighted to be speaking on such an interesting topic. Where does our value come from? And I'd love to begin with a story, a story that starts in 1967, a beautiful sunny day, obviously not England, it was California in this case, and a lady discovers on the side of the road a violin, apparently abandoned. So she uh, picks up the violin, takes it home, and she's not interested in playing it, so she gives it to her nephew. Uh, her nephew is also not interested in playing it, so he puts it in his cupboard where it stays for years and years and years and years. This boy grows up, becomes a man. This man eventually marries, and the woman he marries is a lady by the name of Teresa Salvato. And then in the spring of 1994, now 27 years since the date that the violin had been found by the side of the road, Teresa Salvato discovers the violin in the back of a cupboard and decides that she wants to learn how to play it. So she takes it along to a violin store. And if someone had asked Teresa, how much is this violin worth? She would have said what? She has no idea. Why? Because she no, had no idea where, where it came from. But the violin repair uh, uh, store owners quickly realized that this was no ordinary violin. In fact, it was a very special violin, so special it even had its own name, the Duke of Alcantara. Why was it called that? Because that was the name that had been given to the violin 267 years ago by the person who made the violin, a person by the name of, can you guess? Stradivarius. Teresa had no idea the violin she'd been about to learn to play on was a Stradivarius violin and worth over one million pounds and found by the side of the road. This is a true story. Now, hands up if you'd like to know how a one million pound violin ended up on the side of the road. Well, you can ask me in the Q&A time after the talk. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Stradivarius violins remind us that some things in life are special. Some things in life require that we treat them with dignity and respect. Some things in life are valuable. But here's the question, what is it that makes something valuable? Or to get to the point of the question this morning, what is it that makes you, your life, valuable? in a world of eight billion other people. Well, we can know the value of a violin based on the identity of the violin, and we can know the identity of a violin based on the origin of the violin. Could it be the same for us? If so, then our value as human beings cannot be understood without reference to our true identity, which itself cannot be understood without reference to our ultimate origin. But when it comes to the question of human identity and origin, there are competing explanations on offer making it difficult for us to discern the appropriate framework for our understanding of value and worth as human beings. For example, one of the dominant views of human identity and value in the West 
is the view that there is nothing more to the origin of human beings and of life in general than purely physical causes. On this view, everything we are as human beings, everything you do, everything you think, everything you feel is at bottom just physical processes playing themselves out in a complex system of cause and effect. To quote the renowned uh, psychologist and atheist B.F. Skinner, man is a machine. A complex machine, of course, but in the end, simply a machine. And in that respect, his behavior is completely determined in accordance with physical laws in operation. This is what he believes. In fact, it is what many people today believe. But if this is what someone believes, it raises the question, what is it that makes anyone or anything special? No surprise then that many young people are growing up wondering to themselves, Am I even special? Am I even significant? Is there anything that makes a human being special or significant? Now, I visited the concentration camp uh, named Auschwitz uh, earlier this year. And one of the things the tour guide explained to us was that the reason many of the officers in charge of the gas chambers were able to separate some people for work and others for the gas chambers without any sense of moral anxiety or guilt was the belief that each and every human being that stood before them to be told either to go to the right or to the left was in the end, at base, nothing more than meat and bones and chemicals and at a deeper level and more fundamental level than that, nothing more than just molecules and atoms. But interesting, interestingly, part of the re reason for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which came into effect shortly after World War II, when the world was still reeling from the horrors of Hitler's concentration camps, was this sense that this must never happen again. This evil, this complete and utter disregard for the innate worth and value of every human life. And so in the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it reads... The people in the United Nations have in the Charter reaffirmed their faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and in the equal rights of men and women. So you see, at the heart of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there is a faith. Did anyone notice that? An explicit affirmation of faith that each and every person has inherent dignity and worth, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, beliefs, or sex. It's a dignity or a worth that we didn't earn and cannot forfeit, a dignity and worth because of which human beings accrue certain natural rights, which we call human rights. And when I speak on university campuses, I, as I have the pleasure of doing, I find that almost everyone affirms this faith in fundamental human rights. Um, dignity. It's the closest thing I would say we have today in the universities to a universal faith. So of course almost everyone affirms the view that slavery is wrong and genocide is wrong and child abuse is wrong because all these things are a violation of human dignity. Which is why with all the very important discussion and debate happening today about race and about justice no one, you don't see anyone on the television arguing whether or not racism is wrong or, or whether or not uh, treating people unjustly is wrong. No, the debate is actually about well, what is just and what's unjust, what is racist and what's not racist. Because the debate is not about whether or not to believe in the ideals of human dignity and equality. The debate is whether or not we're actually living up to these ideals that we say we all believe in. But we can be really thankful, actually, that the starting point of almost everybody's discussions and debate is the belief in the value of every human being. Because for most of human history, that has not been the starting point assumption. For most of human history, most human beings have been somebody else's property. Either they were a slave, or they were a woman or a child, which means that they were practically owned by the man in the house who could do with them whatever he wanted, or uh, they lived in a, a land in which the emperor was treated as God and his people as his chattel. Even the most inspiring democratic rhetoric of ancient Greece, it never applied to slaves or women or foreigners. Even the great philosopher Aristotle believed that women and slaves were naturally inferior beings. And infanticide, the killing of unwanted children, well, that was normal. And historians say there was very little regard for the poor. So when I ask 
the best and brightest university students, that's you. Um, why um, do you believe in the worth of, and dignity of every human being on the face of the planet, given that that's not what most human beings have believed throughout history? Things get interesting. Because I've discovered that most uh, people who believe in human dignity have no idea why they believe that. They have no idea on what foundation their faith in human dignity is based, whether it's a rational faith or not a rational faith. And interestingly, even the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is silent on this very question, why? Why do we believe? Why do we have faith that every human being has innate dignity and worth simply by virtue of being a human being? Where does this notion actually come from? Well, many respected academics have pointed uh, this out. Charles Taylor, Larry Seedentop, Philip Gorski, Eric Nelson, Tom Holland, Brian Tierney, to name a few, that the notion that every human being has in an innate worth or dignity is, historically speaking, a product of Judaism and Christianity. Historically speaking, a product of Judaism and Christianity. Uh, the classic scholar John Riss writes, the view that rights are the universal property of, of men as such was virtually unknown in classical antiquity. It is in many respects an ethic whose first espousal depended on the theological belief that man was formed in the image of God. So arguably the most revolutionary, uh, revolution, see if I can say it properly, it's hard for an Australian, anything more than three syllables. Arguably, arguably the most revolutionary idea in world history, I got it, comes from the first chapter of the first book in the Bible, Genesis, verse 27, which reads, God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. When you and I look at each other, human beings, it's easy to emphasize the differences. And of course, the Bible does emphasize differences. It speaks of the beautiful diversity of human beings, of nations and tribes and peoples and tongues. But it also, also speaks of a, an even deeper unity of human beings as image bearers of God Almighty. And it teaches us that we should regard uh, he who looks different to me not as other, but as brother or as sister. And it reminds us in Acts chapter 17 that God made from, from one man every nation of humankind. So the historians tell us that right from the start, Christianity was really countercultural in its insistence that men and women and adults and children and free and slaves and citizens and poor and kings and subjects and nobles and laborers and wealthy and poor were all equally precious beings made in God's image and all equally fallen and, and sinful, whether it's the pauper or the king, and all equally those for whom Christ Jesus bled and died on the cross. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes, Jesus is the saviour of all men, and uh, Christ died for all. And that's a fairly inclusive term, all. Now, sadly, the church has not always lived up to the teachings of the Bible. Sadly, Christendom has not always been faithful to Christianity. And terrible things have been done uh, by people calling themselves Christians, including notoriously involvement by some in the slave trade and then trying to justify it with the Bible. So Christians need to own that historical reality, acknowledge it. We, we need to tell the whole story. But it's also equally the case, if we're telling the whole story, that Christians throughout history, motivated by the truth that each and every person matters because they matter to God, have done more than any other group to combat slavery and uh, genocide and infanticide and to promote access to education and science and the arts and political freedom and social justice and to pioneer hospitals and orphanages and charitable societies and law reform. And the interesting thing is a lot of people don't realise this anymore. There's a historical amnesia. A lot of people don't realise that the moral beliefs in the UK about freedom and justice uh, and the civil and criminal laws that are based on these beliefs uh, owe their existence to the pervasive influence of this Christian teaching on our thought and society over hundreds of years. One historian says it like this. He says, people in the West, even those who imagine that they've emancipated themselves from Christian belief, are in fact shot through with Christian assumptions about almost everything. All of us in the West are a goldfish and the water that we swim in is Christianity. Now, what this historian is not saying is that everyone's beliefs are Christian. But what he is saying that everyone's, uh, next slide if that's possible, everyone's uh, morality is. 
in the West at least. He's saying that our residing instinct, that it's somehow morally wrong to treat other human beings as valueless, as just someone else's property, that this moral instinct didn't come from nowhere. Uh, historically, it came from the Bible and from the biblical notion that we've been made in the image of God. And one of the big questions of our day is, uh, can we retain our belief as a society in the inherent dignity of every human being if we continue to cut ourselves off from the root that nurtured those beliefs in the first place? Now, interestingly, the atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche argued 150 years ago that without belief in God, there is no basis for belief in the equal value of all human beings. So he put it like this. He said, the masses blink and say, we are all equal. Man is but man before God, we are all equal. Before God, but now this God has died. Despite Nietzsche's uh, observation that getting rid of God also means getting rid of any reason to believe in human dignity and value, there have nonetheless been very sincere attempts by thinkers to explain or to justify the notion of human dignity in something other than God. And by far the most common approach in doing so is what's called a capacities approach to human dignity, so-called because it's an approach that seems, seeks to explain our value as human beings in terms of this or that human capacity. So for example, it's commonly argued that our value as human beings resides in our capacity for rational agency, our ability to make decisions on the basis of reasons, rational or moral, that's what makes us valuable. Or that it resides in our capacity for personhood, that's our ability to ascribe hopes and beliefs or actions to ourselves. That's what makes us valuable. And look, I agree that those capacities are, are valuable. They're incredible, in fact. But the trouble with pointing to them as a ground of human dignity, in my view, is that there will always be human beings who do not have such capacities. For example, newborn babies, or those born with mental or cognitive impairment, or those who develop Alzheimer's, and yet it's the dignity of human beings like this that most people intuitively want to protect. If we're only going to recognise the worth of human beings whose cognitive function rises to a certain level, which is very high in this room, by the way, rather than all human beings. This raises a question, which is exactly when does a human being develop sufficient cognitive capacity to be worthy of the category of possessing value and therefore rights? And it also raises the question of, and who decides? For example, evolutionary biologists James Watson and Francis Crick argued that we should wait three days after birth to decide whether to allow a baby to live because some genetic defects aren't detectable until after birth. The Princeton philosopher Peter, the, the Princeton philosopher Peter Singer uh, argued that even a three-year-old is a grey case because toddlers uh, don't really have much cognitive functioning. Just two examples, but I think the examples highlight the difficulty with any theory of human dignity that tries to locate it in terms of some cognitive capacity or ability, is that it will always exclude some human beings. And usually, those human beings whose dignity we intuitively want to protect, not least because they cannot protect themselves. And the other major problem with a the theory of human dignity that attempts to locate our value in a particular capacity is, it's really hard to see how this would not imply that those human beings with more of this capacity, such as you guys, must possess a greater worth than those human beings with less of this capacity. And it's hard to see how this would not lead to an understanding of human equality, to borrow an Orwellian idea, that all human beings are equal, but some are more equal than others. Okay, well, another way in which theorists have attempted to explain the notion of human dignity without God has been by trying to explain it in terms of evolution. The argument here being that because we have naturally evolved as social creatures, this inherent sociability and valuing of each other, that's an adequate foundation for recognising human value. But the obvious difficulty with this argument, as a psychologist Jonathan Haidt observes, is that the story of evolution is not only the story of human beings being social with each other, it's also the story of human beings being violent with one another, as the renowned anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss explains, 
for the majority of the human species and for tens of thousands of years, the idea that humanity includes every human being on the face of the earth does not exist at all. The designation stops at the border of each tribe. In fact, if you're actually, if you're very interested in what evolutionary biologists have to tell us about uh, our universal human desires, well, among the list of universal human desires which are rooted in our human nature, according to evolutionary bio biologists, in addition to sociability, are the desire for war, and in men, the desire for dominance, neither of which represent a promising foundation on which to establish human dignity, particularly the, the desire for dominance, which would seem rather to legitimize such things as slavery, sexual oppression, which are you know, activities that clearly violate human dignity. It's no wonder that the political philosopher Jürgen Habermas, who's not a Christian, writes, egalitarian universalism, this idea that we all have this inherent worth just by being a human being, which he says, sprang, uh, from which sprang the ideas of freedom, human rights, and democracy, is the direct heir to the, to the Judaic ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. To this, to this day, there is no alternative to it. Everything else is just idle, postmodern talk. So, so I want to suggest, and this might, you know, feel free to push back and let's talk about it in Q&A and conversation afterwards, which is more fun, but I want to suggest that the revolutionary idea that we should love and value our neighbour, including the neighbour who's different to us, is not a doctrine that belongs to nature nor to human nature, but to Jesus. Left to our natural selves, human beings do not move inexorably towards universal love, and brotherhood and sisterhood. You may have noticed this, but re repeatedly towards division and enmity, whether that's at the level of nation versus nation, and we're seeing that today, or whether it's at the level of neighbor versus neighbor. And even in the United Kingdom, you may have noticed that things are anything but united. The phrase divided Britain is used to describe a growing sense of polarization in our country. Headlines warn that we're seeing a more tribalized culture. Same thing seems to be happening in many countries. Uh, you know, people moving towards extreme sides of left and right and politics and each side increasingly viewing the other side, not just as wrong, but as evil, illegitimate, non-persons. And so I believe we find ourselves in this moment, in an extraordinary situation in the West, trying to do exactly what the philosopher Nietzsche said cannot be done, which is to hold on to a certain morality without the soil in which this morality was birthed. To hold on to a high view of the equal uh, value of every human being, but at the same time experiencing in our day-to-day -day relationships a gradual sense of eroding of a sense of togetherness and of trust in our institutions, in our politics, and in one another. And I cannot help but wonder whether the reason for our, our increasing distrust and dismissal and othering of each other is that even though we say we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of all human beings, we no longer know why we believe it. And as a result, we no longer truly believe it deep down. According to the Bible, to bring in a Christian perspective, which should not be surprising at a Christian union event, uh, the tragedy of the human condition is that like the Stradivarius violin that was found by the side of the, uh, side of the road, we do possess a tremendous value and worth simply by virtue of who we are and where we came from, but we no longer feel it in our bones because we've lost sense of who we are and where we really came from. And so we end up trying to create or manufacture our value, as well as judging the value of each other in external things, like our academic achievements, or sporting or music achievements, or bank account, or social connections, or physical beauty, when in reality, all these things will one day pass away. But there is something of far greater worth that will never pass away, your soul. Jesus Christ famously said, what shall it profit us if we were to gain the whole world yet lose our soul? What is it that makes your life valuable in a world of 8 billion other people? According to Christianity, that which truly makes you valuable is not something that can be seen on the outside. 
It's your soul. Your soul's the deepest part of your inner self, the part that makes you uniquely you. And just as a precious Stradivarius violin bears in its handiwork the image of a master craftsman, so too your soul bears the image of the master craftsman, God himself. And however insignificant you may sometimes feel, you're not insignificant to your maker. For he sees each and every one of us as as completely unique and irreplaceable, just one of a kind, neither a mistake nor an accident nor a failure, but here on purpose, fearfully and wonderfully made in his image, and therefore not an it, but an I. Not a product, but a person. Not a machine, but a man, a human. A being who's not only a physical being, but also a spiritual being, fashioned for an eternal future in God's good universe and therefore infinitely valuable because infinitely valued by God himself, the only perfectly objective judge of value and infinitely valuable because created in the image of God himself, the ultimate standard of value. And so too is our neighbor and even our enemy which is why, according to Jesus Christ, we are called to love both because we all need saving. And in God's eyes, we're all worth saving for our value as human beings is more than a natural dignity. As my favorite writer, G.K. Chesterton puts it, uh, he's, he's back in the early 20th century, every man is the bearer of the royal image. He or she is stamped with the seal of the divine king Human rights, which are the explication, the unfolding of that intrinsic human dignity, are not so much natural rights as they are supernatural rights. And finally, just to finish, recently my wife and I watched the movie Instant Family, starring Mark Wahlberg. It's based on the true story of a couple that decides to adopt three siblings, and whilst the younger two children find it easier to accept their new parents, The teenage girl Lizzie struggles to accept being a part of their family. She cannot let go of returning to her birth mother, even though her birth mother has abandoned her time and time and time again. And at the end of the movie, her birth mother has once more let her down and the girl has lashed out at her adoptive parents. And um, in this one scene, she runs away from them and hides, but they chase after her and they find her behind a fence crying. And she tells them to go away, leave me alone. But they say they can't do that because they love her. And she says, no, you don't. You don't even know me. But then they show her just how much they do know her by describing all the little things about her that a lot of people wouldn't notice, but they do notice because they really do see her. And it's almost as if she just can't believe that they would really love her, but they really do. And they're like, Lizzie, we really do love you. We love you. We love you. And Lizzie says, stop saying that. Stop saying that. And you can see in this young woman this anguish that she's experiencing as she finds it so hard to accept the love of these people that she's done nothing to deserve, but which they can't help but have for her because they see in her something that she just can't see in herself, that she's incredibly precious and worth fighting for. And I think it's a wonderful picture of what God's love for us is like in Jesus. Because Christianity says it's when we lose connection with God in our lives that our souls get sick and and we end up losing connection with what's really valuable in ourselves and in other people. And that this is the root cause of why we live in a hurting world where people tend to compete rather than cooperate, objectify rather than dignify, denigrate rather than celebrate, pull others down rather than lift lift others up, and envy and resent rather than love and respect. So that's the bad news. But the good news of Christianity is that there is a cure for this soul sickness and that it's to be found in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus, we're enabled to see that it's not what we do that makes us or others valuable. It is who we are based on whose we are, God's magnificent and beloved creation. In fact, the Bible tells us that God values us so much that even while we were in rebellion against God, Jesus died for us. And that on the cross, he willingly bore in his body the crushing consequence of all that deep 
sickness in our souls that causes us to devalue ourselves and to devalue others and to devalue God so that even when we were saying to God, I don't want you, I don't want you, I don't want you, God was saying back to us through Jesus Christ, I love you, I love you, I love you. You might want to consider connecting with the Christian Union here who's hosting this event to find out what it means to know and to receive the love of God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because in the authority of Jesus, let me say to you that if you are willing to open your heart to God's love and his life, he can bring peace and contentment flowing into every aspect of our human existence. A peace that can protect us from the overwork and the worry that comes from trying to find our ultimate value and worth in what we can do and what we can achieve, as well as a peace that can protect us from the strife that comes when we're tempted to devalue others who are not like us or who think differently from us, which is an all too common struggle in our increasingly divided world. Because at the end of the day, God wants us to see ourselves and each other as living masterpieces of the author and creator of life, bearing in our souls his very likeness, which means that we find our ultimate purpose as human beings in alignment for the purpose for which he made us, which is simply this, to love and to be loved in loving relationship with the one who made us and loves us all. Because in his eyes, God's eyes, this is the real music that our souls were created to play. Thank you.